So um, it, sort of the uh, discussion towards the end of that led perfectly to our, our um, final speaker of today, um, Amanda Bott, who is a cardiac nurse at uh, St. Thomas's Hospital and another one of our trustees at Heart File Voice. Um, and uh, just a quick apology for being slightly late there, Amanda, but we'll, we'll be able to capture a bit of time back towards the end. Um, no worries. Amanda's going to talk through uh, rehab, the rehabilitation, and um, some of the kind of key things that you uh, are likely to experience um, just as you, you come around from, from your procedure. So I'll let you just uh, jump in. Uh, there's a presentation there, and then we'll keep capturing the questions. Hello, everybody. As Will said, um, my name's Amanda, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the recovery pathway after heart valve surgery. Uh, just a quick bit about me. I've worked as an advanced nurse practitioner in the cardiac surgery department at St. Thomas's for the last 10 years, and prior to that on cardiothoracic surgical wards and intensive care units. And on a personal level, my father had heart valve surgery a few years ago, so I have a fairly good idea of the full pathway, apart from the theatre bid after surgery. I was introduced to heart valve, um, heart valve voice around five years ago, and as Will said, I'm, I'm a trustee, and I'm really proud to be part of this patient-facing charity. Right. <clears throat> Each unit may vary a little on, in how your care will be managed, and I'll be basing this talk on the current practice in my unit. Prior to your operation, you will have met your, your hospital team who will provide you with the information on how to prepare for your operation and what the operation entails, the risks, the benefits of the procedure and what to expect afterwards. You will be given an information leaflet or if that's not provided, you will be advised where to find it. I will be talking about the recovery pathway immediately after heart valve surgery, going through to home and beyond starting on day naught, which is the day of the operation. So after your operation, you'll be transferred to the intensive care unit, where a specialist team will look after you. There'll be an experienced nurse with you constantly. It can be really noisy at times, as the monitors are bleeping and alarms will be going off, and the lights are on constantly. It's a very busy environment. When you wake up, you may feel a little confused, and you will not be able to speak as there will be a breathing tube in place. Your nurse will ask you to communicate by nodding or squeezing their hand. And once you're awake enough, the breathing tube will be removed. This is usually about three to four hours after your operation. You'll be attached to a whole load of paraphernalia, including a cardiac monitor, which allows the team to see your heart rate and rhythm. You will likely have temporary pacing wires, which will either be attached to a box attached to your bed or secured under a dressing to, for use if needed. There will be small tubes in your neck, your wrist, that the anaesthetist has placed before surgery. These allow your blood pressure to be monitored, blood tests to be taken, and enable fluids to be given, to ensuring that you are hydrated. A urinary catheter will be placed in the anaesthetic room prior to surgery. This is a tube going into your bladder, which enables urine output to be measured and saves you from worrying about going to the toilet whilst you're asleep. There will also be drains placed around your heart to collect any blood that accumulates after the operation. You'll be given very strong pain relieving medication into the veins during and after your operation through a drip, and this was to keep you comfortable. It's important to tell the nurse looking after you if you have any pain so that this can be managed. And the reason why this is so important is because it enables you to take deep breaths. And if you can't take deep breaths, you won't be expanding your lungs and it won't help your recovery. The usual stay in intensive care is, is 24 to 48 hours, depending on if there's a high dependency unit and the type of operation that you've had. Some patients may even be fast-tracked and transferred up to a high dependency unit the same day as the operation. Some TAVI patients may go straight to a recovery area and then to a specialist ward later that day. It's always a good idea regarding family visiting to check the requirements of your individual unit. Whilst relatives are encouraged to telephone for an update, it's really appreciated that only one family member makes that call 
preferably the next of kin, and then disseminates any updates to the rest of the family and friends. Visiting is usually restricted to, to um, specific times, to next of kin and with a maximum of two people, and absolutely no children under the age of 12, because it's not an appropriate environment for them and really rather scary for them. It's best to check before setting off though, um, because even if visiting has been prearranged, if the level of activity in the unit determines otherwise, it may not be possible to visit. So moving on to day one. <clears throat> so the morning after your operation, you will sit out of bed in a chair, hopefully eat your breakfast in the chair that following morning, and um, manage to eat and drink as, as, as you can. There will be a consultant-led ward round, so you will have a whole barrage of blood tests and ECG and any other tests that they think is appropriate at that time. And assuming that you're stable, you'll be transferred to the high dependency unit. You may be seen by physiotherapist at that point, and you will be encouraged to take regular deep, breath, deep breaths. And ladies will be encouraged to wear a suitable non-underwire bra, which is something I think was touched upon earlier on. So on day two, you're in the high dependency unit, hopefully. The consultant ward round will follow again, during which time, big day, day two, lots of things come out. You tend to lose your drips, your drains, your urinary catheter, and suddenly you feel a whole lot more comfortable. The pacing wires, however, will stay in until at least day four. And the reason for this is in case your heart rate starts to go rather slowly after um, a couple of days. There'll be further blood tests and an ECG as well. You'll sit in a chair and you'll be encouraged to march up and down on the spot and take a few steps if you can. Regular pain relief will be offered and it's important to keep comfortable so that you can continue with those deep breathing exercises and start mobilizing. And as I said, you, we know that you will recover more quickly if you're able to take deep breaths and get up and move around. You'll be encouraged to eat and drink as, as best you can. And I'm afraid you will regularly be asked if your bowels have been opened. And if not, you'll be given some medicine for this. And hopefully by day two, you'll be transferred to the surgical ward for a bit more of a normal end to your journey, as it were. By day three, a bit of a familiar theme here, there will be another consultant-led ward round. You will likely have a chest X-ray and routine blood tests. You'll be encouraged to mobilize around the ward, to the bathroom, dress in your own clothes, and sit out in your chair for most of the day. Additionally, you'll be encouraged to do regular exercises, and if needed, we'll have specialist physiotherapy to help with this. You should be able to eat and drink, and you will be asked about your bowels again. You'll be offered regular pain relief. Again, ongoing theme, we want you to be comfortable so you can move comfortably, which will help your recovery. And we will start planning for your discharge. Now, for example, is the appropriate support in place for you at home? Do you have transport to go home? By day four, following the consultant led ward round, you will have routine blood tests, ECG, and if you've got pacing wires in and it's appropriate, the pacing wires will be removed. Your wound dressings will be removed, and this may be the first time you've had a glimpse of, of the actual wound underneath the dressing. These will be checked, and if your wound is Um, Amanda, you've, uh, I think you might have uh, lost your audio. You may have muted yourself. Looks as though she's frozen. Lost her visual now as well, haven't we? Uh, yeah, we'll just wait for her to come back. Not connecting. Uh, I'll just use this uh, moment again just to remind people that uh, if you want to get in touch with uh, Half Our Voice to follow up any questions then please do. You can find our email address on, on the website um, and also uh, again through through Facebook um, we're more than happy. I've been so impressed with the, um, the, the questions today have been absolutely superb um, and um, we really appreciate those. Those that are patients who've been treated on, in the community today, we would love you to share your story with us. On our website, you can see um, 
lots of patient stories like um, Alison's and, and, uh, and Ian Berry's. Um, they really do inspire patients who, who are worried about uh, their treatment. Livy will testify to that. Um, if you look at the metrics on our website, it's the most read part of our website. So if you're there and you feel as though you'd like to share that with us, um, then please do get in touch. Uh, Callum, who's head of content, will be more than happy to arrange a conversation with you. Um, what's that? We're just, uh, I think we're still waiting for um, Amanda to, to sort of be able to connect properly. I, th I think she tried to connect and then didn't. Um, it might be, I don't know if one of the team might be able to message her and let her know that she can join by phone if there's an issue with her, her internet. Uh, internet and uh, the phone numbers are on the email. I don't know if uh, yeah, Elster or Callum can contact her. Just uh, just to clarify, Will, while we're just waiting for um, our speaker to come back, the the um, there were quite a lot of questions with the, relating to the different sessions, and I, it's, I've been really impressed with the interaction and so many people uh, asking questions and interested, which is what we want. But obviously, <clears throat> some of the questions relate related to sessions earlier on in the day that we didn't have time to fit in. And can you just say again, I know you mentioned it a couple of times, just to reassure people that may have submitted a question, that we will collate all the questions. And uh, I think you and the team will be, if we need to seek seek out the speaker to, to get a response, we'll be, that'll be happening. Is that is that right? Yeah, exactly. So we'll do a general Q&A summary note, which we'll share across all our social media. If you want to email um, in a, a specific one that you perhaps might want a more pri private response, um, you can email admin at heartvalvevoice.com. Um, all the questions will be answered by an advisory panel of experts, medical experts, many of the people that you've seen today. Um, we, whilst they won't be able to answer specific medical questions on your, um, whether it's a type of medicine that you're on or dosage or anything like that, that's, that's for your treating clinician. But the, the questions that we've seen would be uh, uh, completely answerable by our advisory panel. So um, that would be good. We would also love you to um, email in to admin at heartofourvoice.com any kind of testimonials of today, how you thought of today, how you think we can repeat this. Already the team are starting to look at putting a program together for meditation and emotional uh, support for, for patients. We'll probably look to rerun that. Um, Heart Valve Voice is here for you, your uh, patient community. Um, we want to be able to make sure your voice is heard with clinicians. But as Ian said, we, we go into parliament and we talk to policymakers to challenge some of the low treatment levels here in the UK, the inequalities of treatment. We've recently uh, established a specific heart valve disease group in parliament, an all party political group um, of 10 members of parliament, cross members of parliament, who will focus purely on making sure that um, we improve the patient pathway for, for patients. So, uh, that's great and many of the speakers that you heard today will be involved in an advisory panel for that group so um, if you want your voice heard then please engage with us and, and we'll make sure that happens. I think that's a really good point Will. Um, I, I just want to give, give you the opportunity in a moment to remind people who might be listening to this in terms of what else has been happening this week and what is still to come uh, but I think the, the what you touched on in terms of looking at some more patient facing activities for heart valve voice sort of reflects a lot of comments both in Facebook and on the webinar to do with the emotional and psychological aspects of having a heart uh, valve condition and we know that the heart is it you know that just the word heart means so many different things and there's a lot of emotional uh, sort of value tied up just with the sense of what is your heart so it's a little bit unique compared to other organs. And I, I wonder whether that might be a factor that why it triggers so much uh, sort of emotional, um, sort of uh, uh, either instability or, or natural and understandable concerns and anxiety. And I'm really pleased that a lot of our contributors have acknowledged that side of it that often doesn't yeah. get talked about. 
no, that's it. And it's a really important part of some of the discussions that happen at the trustee meetings. Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the that, that kind of discussion also went into uh, the development of our app, which we hope to launch very soon. And again, in this community of people listening, we are going into a testing phase of that. So if you'd like to be involved um, in uh, getting access to the app before we launch it, we'd really be keen to hear. That's got a symptoms tracker in there, a consultation guide and information about the various steps along the patient pathway. And we'll make sure that we include um, issues around that we've, we've learned today. Uh, you asked me about the, uh, the valve week. Yeah. Um, so uh, like I say, we've had a media campaign for the first couple of days. We launched our magazine that we distribute normally in a hospital, but this uh, time around it was a digital, so you can access that on our website. That's packed full to the brim of um, patient stories, information of, about heart valve disease and the activities that uh, we carry out throughout the year. So it's a good read, grab yourself a coffee and have a sit down and you can uh, uh, see that on the website. Um, we've had a number of patient videos that have been distributed over the week uh, describing uh, various parts of heart valve disease pathways. Uh, we also carry out a mile walk. Uh, this is a campaign that's been going on all year. We're encouraging patients to walk a mile on the 20th of every month uh, to raise awareness of the disease and celebrate the quality of life. And our ambition is to walk the length of, uh, of uh, the UK, so uh, virtually, of course. Um, I think, Elska might have to correct me, we're, ju we're just reached into Scotland now from Land's End. So hundreds of people have participated. And this 20th um, uh, of this month, hopefully, will be a bumper. So if you would like to get out and have a walk, you walk a mile, uh, share your, a picture of you doing the walk, or share uh, your mile walk hashtag, um, and see if we can get to uh, Land's End before Christmas. And the idea is not necessarily to raise money, uh, but it's more for raising awareness, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not a sponsored walk or anything like that. It's a virtual yeah. celebration yeah. of raising awareness. So yeah. uh, if it would be easy to do that if it wasn't. We just get Ian Berry to cycle the length. He could do it in about <laughs> two days for us. <laughs> so uh, however yeah. long it takes you to do your walk, that's fine by us. Yeah, and share a picture. And you'd like people to share it on the heart, share it onto the Heart Valve Voice page or use a yes. hashtag. Is there a hashtag? Hashtag mile walk um, is, is the one. So um, we've also, we'll also be announcing on Saturday our photography competition winners. So every year we have an exhibition in the Houses of Parliament where uh, 11 regional amateur or professional photographers enter a competition to be selected to then be partnered with a patient who's had treatment to then capture the quality of life. We saw some questions from Brenda. She was one of our patient models last time round for the competition. Um, and uh, the photographers capture 10 images of the celebration of life after treatment. And then we have an exhibition in Parliament. We invite everyone down uh, into the Houses of Parliament, which is always a good, uh, a good day out. And that, um, those will be announced on Saturday. Mm. And the, the visit to the Houses of Parliament, that's not disrupted by the um, current situation? Yeah. So normally our exhibition is in November. Um, we've got a tentative date a little bit later than that, but we're fully aware that you know, that's where we are by then, it could be, we could be in a very different place, but uh, the competition is now open, which is great. Oh, Just, I um, think, Alice, is she rejoining? Um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing her just yet, but um, if I, I, I'm sure there will be uh, patients who are waiting for surgery uh, that were really keen to listen to what Amanda had to say and what I suggest because the time's running away a little bit is that um, Will and myself can liaise with Amanda and I'm, we can record her talk separately and make that available to people. That's um, a good that's a good call actually Simon. Yeah. So um, I'm not seeing her coming up on my screen as yet. Um, okay fair enough. I think I, it's whether she wanted to join uh, using a phone line. Um, yeah. I don't know, there's, um, I would need, there's a phone number, a call in listener, but I'd need, but that's on the attendee list. I would need to verify that just in case yeah. it's not Amanda. Yeah, no, it, I, I, just I be cautious. Number. Yeah. yeah, no, I think what we'll, what we'll do, I think you're right, Simon, is, is that we'll uh, record Amanda's rehabilitation yeah. session 
um, and make that available on the website and we can do that. Uh, it's yeah. been a long day for everyone on Zoom. I think this is, uh, <laughs> especially for people who are new to Zoom, this is a, a mammoth session. So what I would like to do, if that was possible, is just kind of um, close out the day with a bit of a summary, Simon. Um, our surgeon who was due to attend uh, to kind of do a bit of a, a summary roundup with me is still in surgery, I'm hearing. So um, I'll just kind of go through uh, as a summary and if there's any final questions uh, people can fire those out so looking back we started the morning with our breakfast session with Roger Black who shared his experiences of heart valve disease with Chris Young our chairman and Huon Gray the uh, recently retired national clinical director for heart disease um, Roger um, was very open about his diagnosis and his treatment pathway and how that affected his career as an Olympian um, but what he was very candid about was the fact that he now recognises as he gets older that he needs to be much more aware of the symptoms and signs of heart valve disease as his procedure will become closer and closer to him. Um, so uh, that was wonderful and kind of just set the, the day. Um, we then were joined by Ben Oishar, who's the president of the British Heart Valve Society, in his car in the car park while he baked um, in his car because he was struggling with uh, traffic, sadly. But Ben Oi gave a very comprehensive and very rich explanation of uh, heart valve disease, its prevalence, and uh, used some wonderful imagery to demonstrate what a uh, diseased valve looks like and I know we had lots of questions for Benoit and he's again ah Amanda you're back I'm just doing a bit of a summary I'll just trawl through the summary and then we can pick up just the last parts of your presentation is that all right yeah I'm so um, sorry about that I don't know what happened don't, don't worry. What we, what we might also do, Amanda, is, is record it separately in, in its entirety again another time with you and we can put that on the website. But it'd be nice to hear you finish the presentation. <laughs> um, uh, the session three was Keith Pierce with the live diagnostics of a stethoscope check and echo. Um, he talked very candidly about telemedicine um, and the importance of uh, making sure that patients use the face-to-face -face opportunity um, as best as they can. So we talked about our symptoms tracker uh, um, and, and uh, how to make sure that you get across the right information so that the diagnostic test can happen. We then led on into uh, Dave Smith talking about the effects of COVID-19 on valve clinics and how we've had to move into that telemed environment, this new style of appointment. But actually we've been able to lock in a lot of best practice that we've experienced because of COVID and that you can access your clinicians and that wider team through the use of technology. But what he said was most importantly, it's about making sure you ask the questions if anything is unclear, use that opportunity. Um, if you're on a Zoom or a telemed call with your clinician, make sure they're there for you. Um, those clinicians are there for you. Um, Session five, where Chris took us through the gold standard of care, the patient pathway from detection all the way through to some of the issues that uh, Amanda's talking about, um, ensuring that patients understand your treatment pathway um, so that you uh, make sure that you're uh, empowered throughout. And that was highlighted, couldn't have been highlighted any better than uh, Ian's story about the way he researched um, and made sure that he was um, fully aware of all the decisions in his treatment pathway. And he felt as though was, he was empowered and the fact that there was a two-way communication, even down to the uh, issues of looking at what type of valve he wanted and discussing that with his clinician. And then we got the other perspective from Livy about the fact that she's now leading into her treatment. She's excited about the day of her surgery. It's a new beginning, a day of healing, I remember her saying, which I think is just a fantastic outlook to have. Uh, it is a new beginning and it's the first day of healing, her, her surgery date. Um, so thank you, Livy and Ian, as patients for sharing there. Um, we then met another patient, Michelle, who gave a real insight into the impacts of surgery on women. We looked at scars, pregnancy, uh, bras, menstruation, cosmetic effects, um, and some of the real kind of issues around surgery um, before the worries before and the immediate impact afterwards. 
Um, then uh, Amma and his wife Alison joined us. Thank you both again for letting us into a little insight into your relationship um, and uh, an understanding the challenges that carers and patients uh, face, different challenges and how keeping and stressing the, the need for preparation uh, and stressing the need of patience and, and keep communication up. Um, our penultimate session was uh, packed with leading clinicians. We had the president of the Minimal Invasive Society, this mix, surgical, surgical. We had uh, Narain Muranjani, who is the honorary secretary of the Surgical Society. We had Phil McCarthy, interventional cardiologist, and one of the leading directors in BSIS, which is the Transcatheter Professional Society. And Simon Ray chaired the, the, the meeting, who is the president of the British Cardiovascular Society. So these guys are the leading lights in shaping um, uh, your treatment and making sure that the right patient gets the right treatment at the right time. And we discussed the MDT, uh, how decisions were, were made, and it was refreshing to hear, I think you'll all agree, how the patient center, Phil actually said, um, the most important member of the MDT is the patient. It's about presenting the patient with choices and making sure they understand them as well. I think that's key. We talked about different treatment options from uh, traditional surgery to minimal invasive surgery and to transcatheter on both the aortic and mitral valve. And I think that was a lovely balanced um, discussion um, and the fact that uh, it's about making sure that the patient understands that uh, the clinicians want to give you the right treatment but um, not all treatments are eligible for every single patient um, but uh, they also touched on the fact that innovation is driving us forward uh, and making sure that patients get back to that good quality of life. Um, so Amanda I don't know whether you want to kind of Pick up from where you are. We've got a couple more minutes. Um, so I, I can do whatever you'd like me to do. I'm so sorry about that. I honestly, I've been listening to this all day. The internet's been fine. It's not a problem. Well, um, you pick up where you were because I know there were some questions coming through. Um, so well, just, I got to uh, the end. I was, I was just about to start day five, which is discharge day. So I'll, that's I'll right. start there. Okay. Lovely. Okay. So last day. Any stitches which have been seen to be left in your body anywhere will be removed and checked and removed if appropriate. And your dis discharge plan for going home will also be um, checked. You'll be seen by the physio who will give you some advice on going home. And this will also be backed up with a written information booklet. Um, we'll have confirmation of any aftercare, outpatient appointments, district nurse referral if those stitches weren't ready to come out, anticoagulation support, including the, the famous yellow book for the INR readings. Your medications will be checked and there'll be two weeks supply. And you'll be given a copy of the clinical summary of your inpatient stay, um, the same copy of which will go be sent to your GP. Now, if you're going home by car, it's really helpful to have a cushion or a small towel to pop between the seat belt and, and your chest, because it is important you wear a seat belt in the car going home but you don't want it pressing over your wound, which might be a little bit tender. And this works really well. And you will go home with a follow-up appointment for six weeks time. And having, um, things having changed a lot in the last few months, this might be a, fo a telephone follow-up appointment rather than a face-to-face -face one, depending on um, how your operation has gone. Before you go home, uh, we could have next, the next slide, please. Before you go home, um, you will be able to eat and drink normally, have opened your bowels, feel confident to go up and down stairs if you could go up and down the stairs beforehand and you haven't got knees or hips that prevent you from doing this, and you will be able to walk around the ward. Your medications will be prescribed according to your individual needs. It's likely that you will continue on some of the medication prescribed preoperatively, However, you may have additional medication, which you should continue to take until your six weeks follow-up appointment or unless advised by your GP. You will be advised to make an appointment with your GP one to two weeks after going home for a checkup. So your medications can be reviewed, your heart rate, blood pressure and weight can be measured. 
And it's a good idea for somebody medical just to have a little eyeball on you. Recovery time after heart valve surgery. You'll have been advised to have somebody with you for at least the first week after you go home. Um, you really need someone just to give you a bit of TLC and to perhaps wait on your hand and foot and do all the household chores to start with. You should be able to go up and down stairs. You should be able to wash on your own independently and be able to start taking a little walk. But it is important to remember that everybody recovers differently. And, and it can take some time to recover from heart valve surgery. So please be kind to yourself. You may feel physically and emotionally tired. And however, it's important in your recovery to start taking a short walk daily, which, will be incre which should be increased as you recover. I think Michelle, if anyone was, if anyone was listening from earlier, said that she was set a, a goal to increase her exercise daily. It's common to have good days and other days when you feel exhausted or you're just downright tired, but this will pass and it's perfectly normal. And whilst your breastbone is healing, you will be advised not to lift anything heavier than half filled kettle. So if you've got some visitors coming to see you and they all want a cup of tea, now's the time to delegate. They can fill that kettle and carry the, the tea tray into the room. Generally, it takes six weeks for the breastbone to fuse but it will be three months before it is rock solid, which is why it is so important not to lift things you shouldn't be. Try to remember it's normal to have some discomfort over your wound at first, and this will gradually lessen over, over the next weeks and months. Most people will need to take regular pain relief for at least three to four weeks, and then we'll maybe be able to stop it during the day, but we'll end up having a dose probably initially just at night and first thing in the morning and gradually you'll be able to do without. It's important not to lift anything heavy after your operation while that breastbone is healing. And in that initial recovery period, the only exercise you should be doing is walking. If you're keen to expand on this, you should check with your GP or wait until the six week follow up appointment at the hospital. Your sleep pattern may also be altered initially, and it helps if you try to avoid taking a long nap during the day. Um, if you sleep for two to three hours during the day, almost certainly you won't be able to sleep well at night. Other common short-term issues include loss of concentration or short-term memory, and these usually resolve as you recover. Um, be on to the next slide, please. Cardiac rehabilitation is a nationwide program which is available to everybody and arranged at your local hospital. It aims to help you recover and get back to normal after your heart valve surgery. You will automatically be referred on discharge and encouraged to attend the courses, which usually start around six weeks after the operation and last for six to eight weeks. You will also meet other people who've been through similar procedures, which is often really helpful because whilst families and carers can empathize with you, however, <clears throat> they've not been through that experience and it may be really helpful for you to meet others who've been through a similar experience. It will also help your recovery if you're able to eat a healthy, balanced diet, including, including fresh fruit and vegetables and protein to help your body heal. And it's important not to start smoking on discharge if you've managed to stop preoperatively and help can be um, arranged for this if you need it. As I've said, walking is the ideal exercise after heart valve surgery, and it's best to start gradually and build up the distance by increasing the time by a few minutes every one to two days. There should be no gym work, lifting weights, racket sports, contact sports, golf, swish, fishing, swimming, cycling, whatever else you can think of, until you have been told that you're able to do that. And you should also not be mowing the lawn or digging in the garden for three months. It is a legal requirement not to drive a car for four weeks after heart valve surgery. However, it's usually recommended that you wait for six weeks to allow for your concentration to improve and your, your breastbone to heal. Before you start driving, you should be assessed by your GP or at your, on your six week follow up appointment. Returning to work, you should usually be able to go back to work between four and six weeks after your surgery. I'm talking about an open heart operation here, not a tabby. 
<clears throat> and this depends on your job. If your work includes manual labor or heavy lifting, you will need three months off work. And when you go back, it's best to have a gradual return where possible with lighter duties or reduced hours. By three months, this is the magic number really, three months, you should be back to your usual self or hopefully better than before. And you can resume all of your normal activities. With sport, it's advisable to start slowly and build up your stamina though, not go hell for the leather with a squash, a squash match straight away. No. The, the, the message is be sensible as you start to increase your exercise. And thank you for listening to me. And I'm so sorry about the break in the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Amanda. Not a problem. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, just one or two quick questions um, from Louise. Um, uh, someone mentioned that you get a card when you've had surgery with the name of and type and size of the valve, and you can carry that around. And we've seen many of them. Where's the best place to get that? Do you know where they get that from, Amanda? Well, actually, um, we give them out at St Thomas's at the pre-assessment clinic. We, we give it out then and it, you can already put your, your name on it and it also gives you a little bit of advice about um, preventing endocarditis. Um, I don't think I've got one in front of me because I'm actually at home, I'm not at work today. To, mm. But I can let you know the information. So I can tell you that the British Heart Valve Society has been involved in endorsing this card. Whether mm. this is just a London um, based project for now I don't know because it's relatively new yeah but yes it is really helpful to know what the type of valve is and um, when it was put in and, and quite often one of the patient the questions that patients phone up and ask about is what type of valve have they got and can I have an MRI so yeah. it is really important to yeah. know what you've got in there no, we'll, we'll, we'll bottom that out and um, we'll maybe talk to Benoit as well uh, and uh, I know Hewan's involved in the, the London boroughs for, for cardiology so we'll talk to him as well. One question we had from Olivia was around uh, breathing tubes. Are they taken out while you're sedated, Amanda? Um, so you'll be dopey but you've got to be awake enough to breathe on your own before it comes out. Uh, but the thing to remember is the thought is worse than the deed. Okay, mm. they slide out really quickly. They're out within seconds. And uh, you will be quite heavily sedated still, or she will, or whoever would be quite heavily sedated. So if there's some discomfort, it's momentary. Right. Uh, and Heidi, uh, I presume you'll only be able to answer this from, from St. Thomas's perspective, but Heidi's given us a question, and um, uh, asked a question on, uh, I think it's Facebook. Do you get a card if you've had a homograft? You might not know the answer, we can find no, it. No, I don't, I don't think you routinely do um, because you've not got a mechanical or a tissue valve, or well, you have got tissue valve, but it's not the same. Mm. No, it's, it's, a nat it's a natural um, product, isn't it? So I don't think yeah. you do is the answer okay. to that. <laughs> well, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely chase that up as well. Do we have any more questions? Because we're, we're, we're just about to... Yeah, I think so, there's, the, uh, there's the comment from Amma, um, really appreciating the advice that you gave, Amanda, um, about the importance of rehab, not just for the physical side, but because everybody there knows exactly what you're going through because they've been there too. Right. And uh, would you uh, reiterate, I guess, the, the value of the more communication with the patient and their partner or family before a procedure would you say generally that reflects in a better experience for the patient? I think it does. Um, I, mean, I, I can only speak for the centre where I work. Um, and I have to say, we don't talk an awful lot about the rehab courses post-op beforehand, but we do talk about the initial period of going home to prepare people. So maybe there's a little bit more work we could do on the longer term care. But certainly at St Thomas's, we give out a, a booklet Called having heart surgery, which has been updated from when Amma and Alison, or the one that they received, and it now incorporates the going home bit. So they've got much more of an idea um, of what to expect longer term. And it goes without saying you have to explain beforehand that they will require three months off if they have a manual job, and you know you can't go back to the office two weeks after your surgery because you won't be ready to. And but some people don't actually appreciate that at the time, I think. There's a lot to take in on the day you come to the hospital and learn that you're going to be having heart surgery. 
I don't know whether you're the best person to answer this, but I don't know whether patients understand the importance of rehab. Uh, one of our audience members, Victor, was making that point, saying uh, it's so important, uh, the rehab aspect. And do you get do you get a good sort of buy-in from patients who actually do come to the rehab, or do you get a certain number who, who don't want to engage with that? I think there will always be a certain number who think that they can do it without the appropriate course. I can see Alison's popped up on the screen there and I know that she had troubles um, actually getting on her local rehab course because it was overbooked, which is a huge shame because I genuinely think it helps the patients and their family members actually if they can go to rehab. And then, then you've got the confidence to know that whatever exercise you're doing is safe and you're heading in the right direction with it, it's tailored for you. And you're talking to people who've been through similar procedures. And you know, we can empathize, but we've not actually had this done. So you don't actually know what it's like. Is that a, for, for some patients that key thing about building up confidence afterwards? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there'll be some people who, who want to run before they can walk. <laughs> but, <laughs> I think that was Ian Berry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, there's, there's everything, there's every scale that you can imagine. Yeah. Um, involved in all of this there are some that need huge encouragement to get out of bed and some that you know are out of bed before you can stop them so it's about pacing themselves we've got two questions from facebook um one from richard williams and one from tina uh, or excuse me if i pronounce this wrong sond um i'm not sure amanda you'll know the answers to these so we might have to come back to them but it was about the prevalence of endocarditis do we know what the prevalence okay. of endocarditis is and how do we avoid it? Well, I don't know the formal statistics, but it usually no. occurs quite often in the spring. And um, there are a few around at the moment, so I guess heading towards autumn is another time. Um, mm. Sometimes it's that you don't know where you've got it from. Sometimes it's after the dentist, after uh, an injury. Um, who knows? Yeah. You can only look after yourself to the best of your abilities and watch out for the signs. So, so to answer that, Richard, uh, we will come back to you um, uh, with, with uh, specific research uh, data that we should be able to find for you. But if you look on our website, we recently did a campaign on endocarditis with um, an interview between a patient who caught endocarditis, um, uh, David Eaton down in Brighton, and uh, Bernard Prendergast, who's a professor at uh, St. Thomas's, who, who specializes in endocarditis. So have a read of that. Um, and there's a patient story as well, uh, Janine, who uh, caught endocarditis recently um, and who recovered. And the, Tina, your question about eligibility of the pneumonia jab for mitral valve repair, I think, or regurgitation. And I don't know whether that means whether you were treated or not treated. But her GP has said she's not eligible. I don't know. Do you know anything about uh, that jab, uh, Amanda? Am I... I do know a little bit about the jab. Uh, I don't know the criteria for being eligible. No, but if don't. you've been treated, they might argue that you don't have the issue anymore and therefore you don't qualify. Mm -hmm. But again, we'll, we'll make sure the advisory panel looks at that. And Tina, if you want to send us a bit more specificity about the question, uh, we'll get the, the, the right answer to you. Um, I think that uh, covers the questions that are coming through from my team from Facebook and Twitter. Um, there is uh, um, uh, some in our questions on the yes. our panel, the, the, some colleagues, some audience members sharing that there's a bit of variation in the, again, in the access currently to do with cardiac rehab and uh, people commenting of how important it is and they're, they're very positive experience and and then if the nhs rehab is not available because of waiting lists and resource issues uh people are offered a referral off to private and we've got mixed views mixed experiences on there some colleagues commenting that uh, their experience of private care rehab was not that good and others saying it was excellent so mm. interesting it's it's a pity there is would you say amanda generally the the is the the aim for the cardiac rehab is is a standardised approach across the UK, but the it's just the resourcing is going to be very variable. Is that the issue? Yeah, the, I mean the, the aim is it, it's a nationwide program, so therefore it should be standardised. 
I think it's down to funding, staffing, those old mm. chestnuts, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, we'd, we'd be keen to hear um, from Hannah uh, and Louise um, mm. about their experience. And I know Victor, Victor's up here in Manchester, has done a lot of work for us. So um, perhaps we might put a, a little st a, a story together for our website to, to capture all of that. And it might even end up leading into some of our public affairs work to make sure that um, mm. we improve and tackle the inequalities that clearly are, are being uh, ex expressed there. No. Just, I know you've got an eye on the clock, but I don't want to labour the point, but this rehab is, I think, can't under, underline enough how, how important it is. Because if, if, if you make a comparison with, say, lung disease and COPD in the patients, you know, stopping smoking, in terms of the, the cost effectiveness of any treatments available mm -hmm. for COPD, um, smoking, flu immunisation, and the third one is pulmonary rehab. Uh, it's much more cost effective and the, the sort of number needed to be involved to get a benefit um, compared to all the other things, much more useful than any of the medications that patients might inhale. And um, so I don't know, uh, Amanda, whether you, how, how it, it does get pushed, I'm sure. I, I know we've talked I, about I think it. it does. And, and after you've had your valve replaced, you've got this brand spanking new valve in your heart. So your heart's going to work much better than it did before. But you will only reap the benefits from that if you help yourself by best getting yourself into the best physical fit, fitness of state or state of fitness um, to really reap the benefits of, of that valve replacement. I mean, to undergo the surgery and then not help yourself at the end of it would be such a shame, wouldn't it? And most people who have recovered fully and, and looked after themselves and got better, got out and about and, and got on with their lives and started doing sport again, will come back and say, I feel so much better. I feel younger, I feel better. I didn't realize how tired I was or how short of breath I was or how limited I was before that, which is just brilliant. That's what you want to hear. Mm. That's why we all do this. But there are, there is a, an element that maybe don't, do that and they don't read the they don't read the benefits and it's a shame right i think we'll i think we'll close out there it's been a, a smashing day i've thoroughly enjoyed it thank you to simon uh for for moderating all the sessions today it was a logistical challenge with so many speakers virtually um and managing q and a's and chats on facebook twitter and all sorts but we we, we got there we we got there um, thank you very much, everyone. We've said it once, we've said it twice. Um, you, uh, any other follow-up questions, then we're, we're here to listen. Thank, thank you. you I'm much. so sorry I did dis a disappearing act. Don't worry, <laughs> Amanda. If, if you'd like to, Amanda, I did express, I said to Will that I'm quite happy to arrange through Will and yourself. We can record your section again if you'd like to. It's not a problem. We can have a conversation. Um, Okay, it, it, whatever you like, whatever, whatever suits you guys. Brilliant. Okay. Thank Thanks you, Will. everybody. Thank you for <laughs> our online community. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> just bef before we go, I'd just like to thank, on behalf of everybody, the audience, the speakers, everybody who's been involved in the back office uh, getting this together. But uh, thanks to the enthusiasm and organisational skills, persuasion skills <laughs> and leadership of Will to bring this all together. And... Uh, if today is a reflection of the rest of this global heart valve disease awareness week then uh, fantastic fantastic effort so well done will uh, on behalf of the audience members and the speakers well done thank you big team effort thank team you effort. thanks Callum. thanks elska <laughs> bye 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 everybody bye